So, as you might remember a while ago, Boris Johnson, Matt Hancock and other government officials were talking about a whole bunch of coronavirus tests that they procured from China. Massively ramping up our, our testing uh, programmes, uh, buying in uh, huge numbers of, uh, of, of, of tests. And to give you an idea of what is coming down the track, uh, we're in negotiations today to buy an, a, a so-called antibody test, as simple as a a pregnancy test that can tell whether you have had the disease. And obviously it has the potential to be a total game changer. It seemed like an incredible development and that these tests could really help out the UK's response to the virus. The only caveat was that they'd be holding out on distribution until they knew for sure that, that these tests worked. And when the results came back, the purchase suddenly seemed like a less spectacular idea. Before we get into the video, if you want to waste $20 million, we can certainly lend you a hand with our merch store. We've recently added a whole bunch of new products, including new countries with shoes pins, button badges, magnets, t-shirts, mugs and more. Unfortunately, the total value of all of our remaining stock isn't huge, but we could help you start spending that $20 million that you have burning a hole in your pocket. There's a link to the store down below. It's hard to understate how important coronavirus tests are to the UK and governments around the world. Having good data, understanding who has the virus and how it's spreading is absolutely vital to having a robust response to the outbreak. At the macro level, it's important for the government to know how many people have the virus and how many are immune so that they can make decisions about continued lockdowns. And at a micro level, with testing data, hospitals can know which staff members are immune and which are actually carrying the virus themselves. So completing tests has always been vital. The problem has been actually getting your hands on them, especially with current levels of global demand. So when two Chinese companies approached the UK government offering them tests, the decision seemed obvious. The problem was that the tests were expensive, they weren't proven to work, and the $20 million price tag had to be paid up front. But considering how desperately the UK wanted the tests, the government agreed to the deal. At this point, the government were incredibly happy with their decision, and it's about now that the news of the purchase exploded onto screens and newspapers, with the government proudly proclaiming that they should have them available in pharmacies within two weeks. Since then, more than two weeks have passed, and the news has gone a little quiet. Go to a pharmacy or head to Amazon, and you won't find the promised tests. And that's because the tests simply didn't work. After signing the deal, and as per the arrangement, the government organised for some of the 17.5 million tests to be brought back to the UK from China. Yes, this was a collection-only deal. Some of the tests were then taken to Oxford University, where, as promised, they were examined before being put on sale. Because, to put it simply, the government wasn't totally sure that the tests would work. For context, the tests that the UK government bought were antibody tests. As you might remember from science class, the human body produces antibodies to neutralise pathogens such as the coronavirus. This is the immune system's response to try and fight the disease, and it's this antibody response that these tests are picking up on. These tests don't require a swab, a throat sample or any sputum, which is good because even the word sputum is disgusting. Instead, they rely on a blood sample. These tests also don't require scientists or any expensive lab equipment. The patient simply collects a blood sample, places it in the well in the test, adds a couple of drops of buffer fluid, and then after waiting 15 minutes, the result is shown in a similar way to a pregnancy test. Instead of trying to hunt down the virus itself, these antibody tests are trying to identify the body's response to the virus, the antibodies. If the virus can detect the antibodies in the patient's blood, then the result will show that the person either has or has had the virus. This discrepancy is because the body continues to produce antibodies for some time, even after the virus has been detected. So even if the body has killed the coronavirus, the antibodies can still be detected by the test. This is good news, because other tests can only tell you if the virus is currently in your system. But antibody tests can also tell you if you've had the virus in the past. However, there are downsides to this method, like the fact that because the test is only looking for the antibodies and not the virus itself, it won't pick up the infection until the antibodies are being produced. That means that in the first couple of weeks of infection, the test will show negative results, as the antibodies fight back may not have begun yet. 
and therefore can't yet find any antibodies. We go into more detail about these tests and the fascinating science of how they tell the difference between a currently infected and recovered patient and how genetic tests work differently in another video and that's linked down below. Anyway, the bigger issue with these tests has always been their reliability and that's exactly why the government didn't just send their 17.5 million tests straight to the shops. There are lots of companies producing antibody tests like the ones we've discussed and thus far they haven't been fully and independently verified. Also, on the whole, these kinds of tests tend to be less accurate than genetic testing. So even once they receive the independent sign-off, they're unlikely to be as reliable as their genetic alternatives. So the government, rather understandably, sent the antibody tests they purchased to experts at Oxford University before they were set to hit the shelves to check that they actually worked. And, well, there's a reason this whole thing has gone a little quiet. The news from Sir John Bell, Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, wasn't good, with the professor saying that sadly the tests that we've looked at to date have not performed well. We see many false negatives and we also see false positives. None of the tests we have validated would meet the criteria for a good test, as agreed by the MHRA. This is not a good result for the test suppliers or for us. The issue was that the tests simply weren't reliable enough and they were only able to identify immunity accurately for those who had previously been severely ill. The university is said to have notified the test manufacturer about the issue and even offered to help them improve their product. But even despite this, the tests the government purchased simply aren't usable and an alternative is likely at least a month or so away. It seems that with the government coming under pressure from all sides, with vital PPE running out and the government getting hammered for their slow response to the virus, they wanted some good news. They wanted to come out and tell the nation that they were doing something right. The problem is that this urge meant, as Professor Peter Openshaw put it, they perhaps slightly jumped the gun. And the pressure continues to mount on the UK government, with the UK falling behind its European neighbours. Jeremy Farhar, the head of the Wellcome Trust, even commented that the UK is likely to be certainly one of the worst, if not the worst affected country in Europe. And when you compare testing efforts, it's easy to see why. With Germany conducting nearly 120,000 tests a day, compared to the UK's less than 20,000. The UK government was clearly hoping that the 17.5 million tests could help them play catch up with the government promising to conduct 25,000 diagnostic tests a day by the middle of April, 100,000 a day by the end of May, and 250,000 a day not long after that. But with these tests proving useless, the government missed their mid-April target, and with testing still at around 20,000 tests a day, the next two targets look almost impossible to hit too. So it's kind of understandable why the UK jumped on this offer. $20 million is certainly a big risk for unproven tests, but with every country around the world desperate for testing, and the UK government needing to up their efforts both for the sake of patients and for the reputation of their party, it's easy to see why the government wanted to make the purchase and spread some good news. The problem is that the risk backfired, leading many to ask why they ever thought such a gamble was justified. The government is defending its decision, insisting that the test failure isn't all that surprising. Chief Medical Officer Professor Chris Whitty defended the move, saying that it would be very surprising if the first test out of the gate, we got to the best outcome that we could for this kind of test. It made a lot of sense to get started early. Even if this were true, and even if it was clear to him and others that this first bunch of tests likely won't work, it's certainly not the message that a jubilant Johnson and Hancock proclaimed to the people when announcing this purchase. In fact, even the manufacturers of the tests and doctors are saying that the government's handling of the incident was misleading. Test manufacturer Wondfo told the Global Times that its product was intended only as a supplement for patients who had already tested positive for the virus, rather than being the perfect test that the government suggested. The other manufacturer, All Test, said something similar, stating that their tests weren't designed for at-home testing and instead were designed only to be used by professionals. Doctors and medical experts have also backed up this stance, with a number of people coming forward to say that the government's initial statements over-promised and were potentially misleading. This whole exercise may have been a step in the right direction, it may have been a valuable learning experience, but it's certainly a disappointing waste for those most concerned and affected by the virus. 
It's understandable that the government wants to share good news at this time of crisis, but it's worth them making sure that they actually have good news before they go and share it. What do you think of this whole situation? Do you think that it was a good investment or did the government mislead the public and overpromise? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, you can get involved in the conversation over on Discord. If you want to be updated on this crisis as it continues, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified whenever we release a video. You can also get more from us across all social networks simply by searching for TLDR News. A special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.